He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was banished. I probably will be too. Please be seated. So I want you to notice something about the communion hymn we're going to sing in a few more minutes. And I do recognize it's a hard one to sing. I apologize for that in advance. If you were here on Ash Wednesday, you've already sung it once, and we're singing it again today. It's a series of verses penned by English poet and cleric John Donne. In it, he pours out a whole litany of sins. He empties his heart. It's not surprising we sing this one during Lent, right? But the final verse contains a fascinating twist. I have a sin of fear that when I've spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore, done laments. Now this isn't what we usually think of when we hear the word sin, is it? I mean, after all, sin is a misstep, right? Just thinking a judgmental or violent thought, saying a nasty word of gossip to someone, eating or drinking the wrong thing, having sex with the wrong person, you get the idea. Or at least that's how the culture has appropriated the word and concept of sin. But here Dunn is saying something entirely different. His sin is a failure to fully trust in the mercy and goodness of God, to harbor doubts about whether God will fulfill the promise, to bear him up on eagles' wings, and bring him to heaven. Let's just sit with that for a moment. It's sin, arguably sin of the highest order, to doubt that you're going to heaven when it's all said and done. But how can this be a sin? Is there really something morally wrong with fear and doubt? Sometimes it feels like we just can't help it. <clears throat> no, there's nothing morally wrong with fear and doubt. But if we go with the original definition of the word sin, which is to miss the mark, to miss the best and the highest truth, then it is indeed sin. God promises that no matter how bleak things appear, Light and love ultimately win, and heaven is our destiny. To doubt that promise is to miss the highest truth, and therefore, done rightly called it sin. So here's where the 40 days and 40 nights in the desert come in. Jesus is demonstrating to us that there's another way to transcend the fears that haunted John Dunn, and that often hold us back as well. Sometimes it really does feel like we can't help but fear and doubt. We try praying the right prayers, reading the right texts, talking to the right pastors and therapists, and that nagging sense that things aren't okay and never will be okay just won't let us go. But fortunately, the tools of word and mind are not the only ones that we have at our disposal. We have our bodies. In Christianity's early days, there was a much more robust theology of the body than we've inherited in our time and place. But I wonder if it wouldn't serve us well to reclaim some of that. Some of you were aware of how I spent my, some of my time away this past month, and that I make it a point to do something similar a time or two each year. I did what any normal
normal priest does with a few days of leisure. I drove to a high mountain pass halfway between the cities of Mexico and Puebla, strapped a 40-pound backpack on my back, and proceeded to make my way from a 13,000-foot high trailhead toward the 17,000-foot high summit of the dormant volcano known as Isla Siwa. Along the way, I experienced several steep, rocky scrambles, a few spots of crumbling ice, more than one precipitous ridge, and by the time I reached the small hut that was to be my overnight resting spot at 15 and a half thousand feet, I had such severe altitude sickness that all I could do was crawl into my sleeping bag and whimper. <laughs> Have I sold you on the experience yet? Yeah. <laughs> tell you, it was completely worth it, and I plan to do it again. While everything I just told you is true, another far more sublime truth was unfolding at the same time. Confused, disorganized, and fearful thinking that so often crowds my mind evaporated with every step I took. In its place came a penetrating clarity, an unshakable joy that I all too often find elusive in everyday life. This is a state that I can describe with certainty as the nearer presence of God. And I have found it to come to me so many times on adventures like this. And I don't have to go quite so high up or far away to have this experience. Many of you also know that, largely due to my wife's inspiration, I often practice Bikram Yoga. It's that crazy 90-minute series of postures done in a 105-degree room. Again, the fog of fear and doubt frequently clears and is replaced by something I believe to be much closer to God's vision and dream for my life. And then there's fasting. Don't think I'm alone in saying that fasting is one of those things I have a hard time ever convincing myself to do. The first hours and days are just miserable. But if I can get myself past that, that's where the magic happens. And I'm not alone in this. Just read the testimonials of people who make fasting a regular and serious part of their lives, and so many will tell you of encountering God in utterly unique ways during the fast. Jesus knew this, and he understood its power. To inaugurate an earthly ministry with such universal implications, he was going to need to contend with Satan himself and to contend well, he was going to need to be in a place utterly free of fear and doubt. So he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. This might seem like hyperbole or biblical exaggeration, but there are documented cases of people doing it. It is possible, and the results can be nothing short of miraculous. Now, I'm not saying we all need to do a 40-day complete fast, collective sigh of relief. <laughs> I am, however, suggesting that the traditional Lenten practice of fasting might mean doing something that we would ordinarily think of as pretty extreme. Now, I say this recognizing that each of us has a unique capacity for what our bodies can handle, although I suspect we often underestimate that capacity. Fasting or something else that's quite physically taxing might not be the best fit for all of us. But to take on greatly enhanced practices of prayer or acts of charity as a Lenten discipline can also have remarkable effects. Perhaps seeking to read or more deeply understand the entire Bible during this season, or to engage in a challenging volunteer activity, demands a significant amount of your time and energy is what Lent is inviting out of you this year. Personally, I found great power in 
stretching myself outside my cultural comfort zone. I've rarely had a season of life when God felt so near as when I was living and working on the west side of Chicago in an environment where nearly everyone around me was of a different race and socioeconomic class. <laughs> Lent is meant to be a time of renewal, an annual opportunity to clear out the clutter of our minds and our lives, so that when the celebration of the resurrection comes, we can greet it with enhanced joy and clarity. Giving up some small creature comfort is probably not going to get us there. But doing something significantly beyond the norm with our bodies and minds just might. So what is your limit? I suggest you go big. This is not to punish ourselves, but to give ourselves the opportunity to get closer to God in a 